Religion likes to promote the idea that when God created everything, although he declared it to be very good a few thousand years ago, one man ate some fruit and turned it all to shit. And so what we have now is something that God doesn't like very much at all. Religion promotes the idea that you suck as a human being and that the world that we live in is soon to be incinerated and replaced with something God actually likes. And everything that God doesn't like and didn't want here in the first place, he's going to incinerate. And in some religious viewpoints, he's not going to stop incinerating them. There's no process by which it is fully incinerated. But that's another discussion. So this is the characterization that religion has of the world. God declared it very good and on the seventh day rested because he thought he was finished. Religion says, no, he's not finished. Jesus says, it is finished. Religion says, Jesus is not finished. So, what are we to believe? We can take a look at the account of creation in Genesis. And it says, starting in Genesis 1, verse 26, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So, man was made in the image of likeness of God. That's what this is saying. It is not saying man is made putrid, wicked, defiled. It says man is made in the image and likeness of God. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God blessed them, and said, Have lots of sex, have lots of children, eat whatever you like. Sounds pretty good to me. And so we also see that everything is given over to man, and we'll see that in the next few verses as well. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So nothing's being withheld, contrary to the lie that gets told. Genesis chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work from which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So he rested because he was finished, not because he was tired. He didn't think, wow, that, that took a lot out of me. I, I need a day off. He declared that he was finished. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. So we look at the things and we think, yeah, this is not very good. This clearly can't be what God created because this is not very good. So, we come to an assessment about things that it's either not finished, or not very good, or most likely both. It's not very good and therefore not finished. And so, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is actually the tree of judging things as good and evil. And ultimately, the thing that you most judge as good and evil is death. That's what we, we come to the assessment that if there's death... De we, we, we generally judge death as wicked. We generally judge death as injustice. We generally judge death as something that's not ideal. And we've even created mythologies whereby God somehow didn't dirty his hands with actually creating death. Which is not that different from the Gnostic idea that there's these emanations and emanations and emanations so that God didn't have to dirty his hands making this wicked material world. Um... And so somehow there's 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 a loophole where God didn't actually create death because it, because we judge death we say that's evil 
therefore something else other than God brought evil into the world. Somehow, God, I don't know, maybe because that step in between, he created the thing that created evil, and so so it's okay. I don't know. But ultimately, by judging death, and we, we judge some death as justice and some death as injustice. Somebody murders somebody, we say that's an injustice. Then we kill that person for murdering somebody, we say that's justice. They're both death. They're both deliberate, premeditated killing of somebody. One is unjust and one is just. But we say, if God created death, then God must not be all good. Ultimately, the tree of not judging things good and evil ends up causing us to be as gods, judging God, usurping his position, and saying what he created can't be very good, or he's not very good. That something It creates this, this discontent with what there is, because whoever made this either has to be not having his hand in it, or he has to be not all that good. So that's really what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, is ultimately it's a judgment against God. And so we see in the book of Matthew, in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Jesus was giving his Sermon on the Mount and said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So, Jesus, if Jesus is God, if it's accurate, in if the Bible is accurate when it states that uh, he, Jesus said, if uh, he that has seen me has seen the Father, and that it says that Jesus is the express image of the of the person of God, and that in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that Jesus said uh, he only does what he sees the Father doing and says what he sees the Father see, uh, saying. You know, if all these things are true, then then we can we can say God looks like Jesus, and I agree with that. I think God looks like Jesus. I think a lot of religion says Jesus looks like one facet of God. And then there's all these other facets that are completely different from what Jesus looks like. I don't agree with that. I think God looks like Jesus. And so if Jesus didn't go around killing people, I don't think God kills people. If Jesus didn't ever burn anybody, I don't think God burns people. If Jesus did never, didn't ever torture anybody, I don't think God tortures people. Okay, I think God looks like Jesus. I think he told the truth when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't think he means, I don't think he meant, if you've seen me, you've seen the, the, the good side of the Father. I think he meant, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I think in the full, if in the fullness of, in him is the fullness, fullness of the Godhead bodily, then we're not seeing a facet of God in Jesus. We're seeing the fullness. We're seeing what God looks like. Okay, so we, need to have Jesus be our filter through which we we determine whether something looks like God or not. So anyway, Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now if Jesus is saying this, and he he's speaking on behalf of God, if he is God, then he's saying something, he's, he's telling you what God thinks. Okay, so he's saying, God says, judge not that ye be not judged, right? This is, we, we can interpret it this way. If Jesus said it, God said it. If God said it, Jesus said it. That's, that's what we're getting at here. Jesus looks like God. Jesus speaks the words of God. Jesus is the word of God. So there's no distinction. There's no separation here. There's no, there's no variance between what Jesus says and what God says, between what Jesus does and what God does, between the kind of person Jesus is and the kind of person God is. So now if Jesus is saying, judge not that ye be not judged, is God a hypocrite? Does he not follow this own, his own, he's, is he holding humanity to a higher standard than himself? Is he saying, don't you dare judge other people, but hey, I mean, that's what I do. I sit here and I, I go, you, you suck. You're, you're okay. I'll pretend to like you. Um, you know, is that is that what we're seeing here? Or are we seeing a hypocritical God giving us a standard by which he doesn't adhere to himself? Or are we seeing something that Jesus actually lived out and demonstrated and proved that that is what kind of person God is? 
that God says, judge not that ye be not judged, because he's telling you, this is what I am. This is what kind of person I am. This is what God is. God is not a judge. Now that's completely contrary to religion, because most religion says God is a judge. In fact, he's a very austere, intolerant, uh, unmerciful God. Uh, unmerciful judge, rather. So, in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Judge not according to the appearance. So here he is again saying not to judge. And this is according to the appearance. So this is, you know, using our senses. Using our tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's not how we're supposed to judge. But judge righteous judgment. So, righteous judgment would be God's judgment that everything was very good. And in John 8, 15, he says, You judge after the flesh, according to appearances, by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, I judge no man. Okay, well, if Jesus judges no man, and he's speaking on behalf of the Father, he's saying God judges no man. Right? And we further see this. It says... In John chapter 12, verse 31, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And so, if this judgment already occurred, it's in the past. Okay, the prince of this world, whoever you want to make that out to be, you want to make that out to be some supernatural rival that God has, that supernatural rival has been cast out. Okay, whatever judgment you think is going to happen, he's saying now it happens. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So it doesn't matter how you interpret that. He's saying this before going to the cross. He's saying that the cross itself was the judgment. The cross itself was the was the world was the world uh, um, system being cast out. Whether that world system is some supernatural competitor or whether that world system is just the way of thinking, I, I don't care. Make it whatever you want it to mean. He's saying it already happened, okay? Because he's saying it, he's saying it, proclaiming it. Here, as he's going to go to the cross, he says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all, un all men unto me. So here we, he, he says, if I be lifted up. So we see that. And so in John, a few verses down, in verse 44, he says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Here he is proclaiming, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You know, so... Religion wants to tell you that he came to save the world from from how much God hates you and, you know, give you an offer whereby God will pretend to like you. I don't agree with that assessment. And we see in John 3.17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So that confirms the same the same verse, that he came not to condemn the world. And we go back to John chapter 8 with the woman caught in adultery. And those who, they, they tried to challenge Jesus to agree to condemn her. And he didn't. And it says, uh, he, he said to them in verse 7, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And it says, They which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. It says, Now when Jesus had lifted up himself, which is a similar wording, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Okay, so it's men who condemn. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I, the Lord God, condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Right? I mean, is Jesus speaking on behalf of God or not? Is he just making his own, you know, hey, his, his own arbitrary decision? 
I'm just arbitrarily going to not condemn you in this particular instance, go and sin no more? Or is he speaking on behalf of God saying, is this, is this an illustration that it is people who condemn and not God? There's no instance here of God condemning anyone. It's only people who attempted to condemn this woman. The person who is the, who is the manifestation of God in the flesh said, I don't condemn you. Was that just for now? I don't condemn you, but you know, if you don't clean up your act when you're dead, I'm going to condemn you. Is that what this is? Is that what this is insinuating? Why is that being read read into the verse when it's not there? So what we have is that he declared everything to be very good, and he refused refused to ever overturn his decision. He refused even in the face of being of being dragged in into the public square and and beaten and flogged with his skin being ripped off and then being nailed to a cross and being left there to suffocate even in the midst of that he refused to say you know what i, I messed up it's not very good i made a mistake i thought it was very good but i guess it's not so we see in isaiah chapter 53 this exact idea in verse 7 something you probably haven't really considered. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep for her shears is dumb, so he opendeth not his mouth. Okay, what, what does this mean, he opened not his mouth? He refused to condemn anybody for it. He refused to say, you know what, you people got it wrong. He, he refused to, to, to say anything about these people. He refused to say, you're going to get yours. You know? I mean, and think about it. You know, he, he does this. He proclaims forgiveness. And then when he rises again, his disciples are like, uh, uh-oh. Now, now he's going to get some revenge, right? You know? But he didn't. It's, it's, it's an, it's an illustration that his, he, he could have. It doesn't make any sense to think that he said uh, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right? So this isn't a request. This isn't, he's not begging, you know, angry God. Gee, please, please be a nice guy and, and forgive these people because they don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones actively, unjustly, and brutally murdering him. And they're murdering him because he said, God is your father, and you look like him. You were made in his likeness and image, and it's very good. This is, this is what Jesus proclaimed, and they killed him for it. Because they said, no, God's not very good. They said, no, God's not our father. They said, no, Abraham's our father. Moses is, is, the, is the rule. You know, they, they worshipped Moses. They worshipped stones. They they worshipped a, a a box that was a, a coffin that they carried around with dead heavy stones carrying around this burden with a bunch of rules on it that were burdensome. Instead of burying it in the ground and going like, hey, meathead, that stuff all belongs in the ground. Bury it where it belongs. You know? And, and so that's why they killed him. Does it make any sense that you're going to forgive the people murdering you unjustly? But you're not going to forgive people that 2,000 years later aren't sure if you were ever a real person or not? Maybe you're just a mythological figure. Oh, I can't forgive that. I mean, that makes no sense. He could have rose again from the grave and said, Oh man, you guys that killed me, you are going to pay. But he didn't. If anybody deserved it, it would have been the people that actively participated in his murder. Think. Just use your brain. He's not holding it against anybody because they don't know he was real. It, and it, it doesn't make any sense. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This was a decree. He speaks on behalf. Of, you got to get this through your head. When Jesus speaks, it is the word of the Father. He is the word of God. The word of God is J-E-S-U-S, -S, right? The word of God is Jesus. So if he said it, that's straight from the mouth of God. So if he's saying, Father, forgive them, he's not saying that for, for the benefit of the Father. He's saying that for the benefit of the audience so that they know that they're forgiven. 
And religion does not believe this. Religion does not agree to this. Religion does not say, yeah, he forgave, he forgave even those murdering him, you know, which obviously means everyone's forgiven. If you can forgive your murderers, you can forgive anyone. That's the, that's the whole point. That's the entire point. There, there's nothing that you can hold against anyone if you can't hold against your murderers. And so, we see in Psalms 103, and verse 11 and 12, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. You know, it's not as far as the E is from the W on a magnetic compass. It's as far as the East is from the West, okay? It's not just, oh, hey, look, it, it, the, your, your transgressions were just one inch away over here at the W. It's not as far as the E is from the W on a magnetic compass. It's as far as the East is from the West. That's supposed to be telling you they're completely opposite, contrary, never meeting, never coming together. That these are things that are completely and totally separate, having nothing whatsoever to do with each other. That's what this, this imagery is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be one inch away on a compass. Okay? As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions for us. They're gone. They don't exist. And so in Micah chapter 7, in verse 18 and 19, it says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the re remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Well, if if he retains not his anger forever, how can he be torturing anybody forever? He'd have to be angry forever, wouldn't he? He delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Well, except for what? Except for what what is accepted from all? He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. All of them. In Jeremiah chapter 33, we even find out that forgiveness is far from being an injustice, which religion characterizes forgiveness as. Forgiveness is actually a name of joy, a praise, and an honor to God. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 8 and 9, it says, And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble, oh no, oh no, we should fear and tremble, for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. So next time you see any verses about fear and trembling, here it is, fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that God procures. So this isn't this isn't being terrified and and terrorized and traumatized and trembling in 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 agony and distress and dismay and feeling complete despair. This is being overwhelmed by a goodness that's beyond comprehension. That's what is being described as fear and tremble. So when you see verses about fear and trembling, don't ever let it make you think that you're supposed to be afraid of your creator. Because that is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil does. The tree of knowledge and good and evil says, well, I should be afraid of God. You know, it's it's pretty simple. If you've if you're if you're feeling ashamed and afraid of God, you've been eating from the wrong tree because that's what happened to Adam and Eve after they ate from the wrong tree. They were ashamed, and they were afraid of God. But God didn't give them anything that they needed to be afraid of when he came and found them. <laughs>